Good evening. My name is Brian Dorries, and I'm the Artistic Director of Theater of War Productions. We're a social impact company that uses theater as a tool for helping communities address pressing public health and social issues. And we're thrilled you could join us this evening for our online presentation of those winter Sundays in partnership with the PBS series, Poetry in America. Tonight's program will present readings of Robert Hayden's 1960s sonnet, Those Winter Sundays, as a catalyst for powerful guided discussion about the everyday struggle of surviving, thriving, and connecting in this incredibly difficult winter. The event will also feature um, a uh, recording of Hayden's poem read by President Joe Biden, helping frame a crucial dialogue between diverse communities about economic hardship, family dynamics, parenting, domestic violence, racism, and American identity during this divided and fractured time. Using the poem to build bridges and create a vocabulary for talking about the challenges before us and within our homes, those Winter Sundays will aim to foster compassion and understanding, healing and resilience. Before getting started, I just wanna take a moment to thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for their steadfast support and for our longstanding 11 year partnership. I'd like to also thank our co-presenter for tonight's event, Poetry in America, a public television series and multi-platform educational initiative that brings poetry into classrooms and living rooms around the world. We're thrilled to be partnering with Poetry in America on this special event, linked to their recent episode exploring Robert Hayden's poem, Those Winter Sundays. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Elisa New, the creator and director of Poetry in America, who will be co-facilitating tonight's discussion with me. Elisa is gonna say a few words about herself, the series, Robert Hayden and his iconic on it. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Brian. What a joy and a pleasure it is to be with you uh, and all the panelists tonight. As you said, um, Poetry in America is a public television series and an educational initiative that's based on the exact same principle that animates theater of war. And that is that great art, art that lasts as long as Greek tragedy, or maybe not quite that long, because that's really long, is art that moves us, that touches us, that speaks to our own lives, and, and that allows us to speak to each other. Um, on the television series and in the open access courses I offer through Harvard and Arizona State University, my aim is always to foster conversations that lead to growth of all kinds, to emotional, intellectual, civic, growth and to communal understanding. Those Winter Sundays that we're reading tonight was written in the 1960s by a black poet, Robert Hayden. And it looks back to some of Hayden's own experiences growing up poor in depression era Detroit. While the poem can be placed historically, it remains many years later, one of the most beloved poems in the American canon for all the things it says to us as parents and children uh, and says about our relationships to our families and our struggles in our families. Thanks, Brian. Thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, really appreciate this partnership and excited for tonight's collaboration. Tonight's event will unfold in three parts. Um, first, the two actors who are with us tonight live will read Robert Hayden's Those Winter Sundays. Tonight, we're pleased to have two wonderful actors with us, Bill Murray, who needs no introduction, and Moses Ingram, who many of you may know from the series The Queen's Gambit. Um, and they're here with us on Zoom to read for us from their homes. And we're thrilled to be able to share a reading of the poem, as I mentioned before, also by President Joe Biden, which was recorded for Poetry in America and its recent episode on PBS. After the readings uh, successively, um, we're gonna have five community panelists with us on the screen who are here now, who will respond in the moment from their hearts and their guts to what they heard and saw in the poem tonight that resonated with their own experiences. We have five wonderful panelists with us tonight, including an EMS officer from New York City, a national student poet from Saratoga, California, a teacher from Flint, Michigan, and two staff members from the RISE Project, part of New York City's anti-violence crisis management system, who work at the intersections of violence, gun violence, and intimate partner violence. 
Following the panelists' brief opening remarks, we'll open up the floor to what we hope will be a lively, healing, constructive discussion with you, our audience, tonight. During the discussion, we'll ask questions about those winter Sundays and how it resonates now in the heart of this cold, hard winter. And if you'd like to respond to one of our questions, we just ask that you use the raise your hand function on Zoom to indicate you have something to say. For each question, we'll call upon a number of the people who raised their hands and remote them to the screen for the duration of their remarks. Tonight's event will be captioned in English. Um, so if you'd like to see the captions, we ask that you all activate the captions at the bottom of your screens now. You can control the size of the script at the bottom of the screen as well. This is new territory for us. I think it's our 31st performance uh, on Zoom, a new way of performing and discussing, a new way of communicating. So we apologize in advance for the fact that we're not gonna get to everyone who raises their hands and there might be glitches, uh, technical issues during the event, but that's okay. To be clear, we're not after polish. Our hope is to invite all of you into this messy live space with us where we'll make mistakes, recover from them, and move forward. By getting messy and making mistakes and then adapting and moving on from them, we're modeling for you what we hope as an audience you'll do during a discussion, which is the main event and will flow out very quickly given that the poem is less than a minute long tonight. Um, we hope that you'll take the risk of sharing your truths and perspectives while not sounding brilliant or polished in order to be present in the moment with each other, even in isolation, without judgment and with shared vulnerability. This is what makes us human and it's the only way out of this mess. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Bill Murray who will deliver <coughs> tonight's first reading of Robert Hayden's Those Winter Sundays. Sundays, too. My father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black coal, then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of loves austere and lonely offices. Wonderful, thank you so much, Bill. Um, we're gonna do something that we haven't done before, which is we're gonna immediately bring in our panelists after having heard this uh, first reading. I'm not gonna say anything else, except I'm gonna ask our panelists, and I'll ask Anthony to go first, to introduce themselves uh, so that we can hear who they are as it pertains to what they have to say. And we've asked our panelists, as I mentioned before, to respond from their hearts and their guts to what they heard and saw in this particular rendition of Robert Hayden's poem that spoke to them tonight. Uh, Anthony, over to you. Hi, my name is Anthony Almagera. I'm the Vice President of the EMS Officers Union and I work for the FDNY EMS here in New York City. You know, um, when Bill was reading the poem, it, it, it's an idealized version of a, of a love lost to me. Uh, I grew up in a broken household and my dad would wake me up. He was a longshoreman and he worked from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. 
six days a week, but he'd wake me up early just because that was the alone time with him. So I'd say goodbye to him. And eventually it got to be such a habit that till this day, I still wake up at 5 a.m. every morning. And I think what that was with him was because it was one of the few times there was no tension in me seeing him. I didn't realize it at the time. When Bill paused, what did I know? What did I know? It's exactly right. I didn't know that that was his one way of getting a couple of minutes with me where my mother wasn't around and there wouldn't be a fight or there wouldn't be tension. And I look back at that moment because it was one of the few things I really had that I could sit there and just hold on to. Dad, have a good day. Or how was your day yesterday? And he wasn't a man of many words. You know, it was good. He'd make a face and, he, you know, he'd sit there and, you know, tap me on the shoulder. It wasn't a big hug moment, but he would wake me up to see him off for the day. And I remember one morning because of where he worked on the docks, he had, and it's funny when Bill mentioned cracked hands, I immediately started rubbing the inside of my hand here because that was always cracked of his. And I would have to help him sometimes on the day off. I'd take this salve he had, it was some homemade concoction that he put together in the bathroom and I would help him get it into his hands because he didn't have the dexterity to do it himself. That was another moment that I had with him. We didn't speak much, but it was my moment with him. Nobody took it from me. And when you grow up years later and you realize how fractured and fragmented the family life was, how I lost them all, you know, they're all passed away and all the trauma you go through. You look back at those moments and it's through a poem maybe like this where you go, oh, that was the one thing I could hold on to that showed that there is a love, even though to me growing up, all the love that was given to me was conditional. And then you see some of these moments when Oh, that was where he tried to make it unconditional. He tried to say, hey, I'm here with you. You're not alone, but I feel lonely too. I'm so alone in this life that I've created. I didn't want this. I didn't know I did this, but I, I'm so alone that I only have 5.30 in the morning with you. And then we go back to our regularly scheduled programming of that tension. So. When I hear Bill read this and when I read it and I hear the story, you know, it's, it's an idealized version of what I wish I could reflectively look back on as a whole, but I take fragments of it and hold on to those and use that paintbrush to paint over the ugly parts. So that's what I get when I, when I hear this poem read out loud. Thanks so much, Anthony. I'm gonna let all those amazing things you said float because I wanna hear what these other incredible panelists say, but I look forward to weaving back into the conversation so many themes you've already brought up. Um, I really appreciate your candor and your openness and your modeling a way forward for how this discussion can proceed, showing us the way. Thank you. Monesty, do you mind going next? Yeah, I. Um... I, this poem, I felt like it was really about like those like little acts of service and love that parents do for their children that it's not like a traditional form of showing love like there's it's not like you hug your child and you tell them I love you it's or like these little actions that they do that like as a child you don't realize that it's their way of showing you love but then you look back when you're older and like it kind of reminded me of like some of the things like my parents do for me like just like little things like my mom like always brings me like throughout the day like multiple times a day she brings me plates of like cut up fruit um like apples oranges grapes like whatever when I'm doing homework or when I'm like having a bad day or something it's like these little like actions of love and like you don't even realize like what a big deal it is until like I try to like cut my own apple and it's like actually really difficult. So I, I don't know. It's just like, that's, that's just what the poem kind of reminded me of is like, there's so much behind the scenes work that our parents do for us. 
Um, and you just like kind of take it all for granted. Um, and I think like, it's like, it can, if you're not used to, you know, ex being expressive about your love, it's like difficult to, you know, like go up to your parents and like hug them or like say, I love you so openly, but it's, there's always like ways around that to still show that you care. So that's kind of what, that's kind of what the poem reminded me of. Thanks, Masi. Could you mind saying a little bit about who you are? <laughs> I'm muted. Yeah, um, I'm a senior in high school. <laughs> and also, I'll, I'll, I don't want to steal your thunder, but Masi is also the, the National Student Poet of the West, which is a, um, uh, a title she earned through the Scholastic Art and Writing Award. So she's an ambassador to poetry amongst other young people her age which is one of the reasons we wanted to have her here today. Thank you so much, Monacy. Um, Natalie, do you mind going next? Yes, so my name is Natalie Arzu. I do live in a Bronx, New York. I work for a project called the, the Rise Project. And um, the basis of that project, which I work alongside Altabar Hudgens, who's also a panelist, is transforming the way we um, respond to intimate partner violence situations. And in terms of this poem, it kind of hit home, especially when Bill said, fearing the chronic angers of the house. So since my brother was taken by gun violence, our home has been very, very sad. So my mom is, I'm first generation American. So my mom immigrated here from Honduras. So a lot of times she's working long hours just so that she can provide for us. But then it's also like that fear of, I gotta make sure my kids has everything because I wouldn't want them to go out to the street and have to figure it out or as well as trying to protect us. So sometimes um, I speak indifferent to her when I was younger because it's like, I want these new shoes. Everyone else has it. Um, why do um, I have to wear these old shoes? So at times like, you know, you can, you, you don't really notice the struggles of the things that they have to do to make sure you have everything. And now as you get older, you start to see the struggles that they did and things that they continue to do to make sure that you have everything. Like they're here so that um, you don't have to um, try to fend for yourself or anything like that. And when you actually connected it to the chronic angers of the house, it's like, you know, the memories are there. The things that you know you miss, whether it's um, loss or tragedy, a lot of times is like, it's cold, it's cold at home. Even though you may have families, there are things that are actually still missing. And for me, that's what connected and resonated with me, especially um, just making sure that my shoes were good. So making sure my mom didn't, if I needed new pairs of shoes for school, like she made sure that um, she bought the shoes for me before she bought shoes for herself for work and stuff like that. I finished. Thank, thank you so much, Natalie. I appreciate that. Thank you for um, thank you for sharing the story about your family and mentioning your brother. I'm very sorry about his death and your loss. And um, but really moved by the work that you guys are doing uh, in New York City to interrupt and stop violence uh, and the innovative work connecting intimate partner violence with gun violence as well. Um, I'm really grateful for both you and Al Tabar to be here. Um, before we go to Al Tabar, let's go to uh, Karen. Uh, next is Bailey from Flint, Michigan. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Bailey, and I'm an English teacher. I teach at the high school level in Flint, Michigan. And um, along with Lisa New, I have been working with students in the Poetry in America course, where we read poems and do much like what we're doing right here, talk about the poems and just talk about how they resonate with us. And for me, and listening to Bill read this poem, what really resonated for me was just the sense of remorse, the sense of loss that seemed to be within the tone of the poem. I, I felt like the, the line where um, it repeated, what did I know, what did I know? You know? To me, I'm thinking that I could really feel that. I, I lost my father this past August. And to me, the, the grief is, is very apparent within the poem, just the loss of a parent you look back and you wonder and you think, you know, what didn't I understand when I was younger? And now you see it in such a different way. And there's no going back. You, you can't go back to that person and tell them that you love them once they're gone. But you certainly 
look at things that they did for you and appreciate those things. As I came to this tonight, I thought, you know, the news of being involved in this, I thought, oh, I'd love to share this with my dad. I shared everything with him. And I knew he, you know, he'd be in the audience. He'd be watching me if he were here. And so it's that thought that, oh, all these little things he did for me. And I took them for granted. And, you know, I told him I loved him, but just little things like showing up, he always showed up. And I, I think that that was what the poet was recognizing. What did I know? Well, at the time he took it for granted, but later he recognized this was something that I didn't appreciate and now I do. Yeah, so that's, that's what really stood out to me. Thanks, Karen. Um, thanks for connecting with, with your own father and sharing that perspective. We really appreciate it. Um, as a father of a 10 year old, I really, I was listening to you really thinking about, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility of, of, of ever being recognized by your child for what you're doing. It seems like you know, childhood is just a process of becoming conscious. And by the time we finally achieve that consciousness, uh, sometimes it's too late to have the conversation that we now understand we should have had long ago if we could have had that consciousness. And I just thank you for bringing that into the room. Um, Al Tabar, uh, you are last but not least in this first round. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, thank you so much. I, I appreciate y'all for having me in this space. Um, so again, my name is Al Tabar Hudgens. Uh, I work on a Rise project with Natalie. So uh, everything she said, uh, I do as well. Um, we, 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 as a team, we all have our different strengths that uplift each other, but overall we work together to achieve that common goal of transforming the way that uh, we respond to intimate partner violence as a community. Um, for me, I think immediately the line that stood out to me was uh, something to the effect of, and no one thanked him, and no one thanked him, right? And it kind of brought me to like thinking about my mom, right? Uh, and one thing that, that, that kind of came out of that was uh, my mom had to be like, the breadwinner and like the mom, right? And like the, the, the housekeeper, right? She had to, to, to manage both roles. And it's funny because now that I think about it, like it would be a time when my mom would ask us to do like any, any task that we're supposed to do, like any old task, right? Sweep, mop, whatever, take the, the chicken out the refrigerator, right? And whatever the task we're asked to do, we're asked to do is we wouldn't do it fast enough, right? Uh, <laughs> And we would do it so not fast enough that she would end up doing it. Um, bear with me, I have a, a, a barking bird uh, that I knew would react at this moment. <laughs> um, give me one moment to just laugh. It's not a first. It's not a first. <laughs> the, the, the beauty of Zoom is that we're in people's homes. Uh, go on, Altabar, please. <laughs> I apologize about that. Um, but uh, to that point about like, uh, when we wouldn't do it fast enough and she would end up doing it. And I don't know if this is a familiar experience to everybody in this space, but for me and my immediate friend group, uh, we, we speak about the the, the way that our, our mothers would hit us with the, all right, well, I'm not here anymore. You're going to miss me, right? Um, who's going to do all this when, when I'm gone, right? And uh, speaking to, to that, but like listening to, and no one thanked him and no one thanked him, it, it, it's kind of clicking to me as like us handling these little tasks that she's asking us to do is her is really like her asking us to show gratitude, right? Like if I do all this thanklessly. I'm asking for like this little from you, and and now as I'm an, as I'm an adult, I see all the places where my mother like deserves to receive gratitude from people in her lives that like it doesn't necessarily come from, and I'm like, oh, that's what we were doing we weren't showing you gratitude. We weren't saying thank you. Um, and that's why it was like so, so, so powerful to you. That's why like it meant so much. That's why you had to let us know that at some point this is gonna mean a lot to us. Um, and, and my mom was a mom who like hugged and kissed and you know, all that and told us she loved us. But that's the one thing that sticked out to the point of like, and no one, no one thanked him. Um, and the other thing that kind of sticks out to me is that like, the the relationship between the the author and his father 
with me being a father now, it's like I hear that story so many times about like in the 60s, in the 30s, back parents weren't like the way you parents are now, right? And I guess to be quick about it, the thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that the that the these these old uh these old narratives I hear about parenting these old narratives that I hear about parenting I don't re replicate with my daughter um and and having her you know what I mean like love me and I'm her dad but also this is my thankless dad who I have to be worried about the angers of the household through mm. Mm. thank you so much El Tabar that's I, there's so much one could respond to in what you just said but I I, I had never thought of it exactly the way I, you last put it at the end, making this connection, I think I heard between the sort of repression of not being able to necessarily express love and the thanklessness that one feels in response from in a cold household as Natalie brought up that homes can be cold and there's these are connected ideas. Um, and what I love about having young people um, uh, as part of our conversations, um, including Monacy, uh, is that it seems like this next generation of millennials and even post millennials are are doing the very thing that you're bringing into the room, which is they're really changing the order of the whole enterprise and saying, you know, actually, we need to talk about these things and we need to break through this culture of repression and we have we can't just accept the way parenting was taught to us from our parents as it was passed down from the 60s. Um, we have to interrogate. Um, whether violence or hazing or rudeness is, is actually a, an integral part of what it means to be a friend or a parent and, uh, or loved one. Lisa, yeah, you wanna jump in? I just wanna jump in and I hope this isn't too dark. Please. But, <laughs> what, what really resonated with me um, so strongly, so much of what you all said, but when Anthony used the word stresses and we're all in our houses <laughs> with our families, um, either uh, falling into old negative patterns or, and I hear in this poem and I am somehow comforted by the representation of that little dance that parents and children do where the child's being indifferent for whatever reason and the parent is maybe being a little bit of a martyr or <laughs> I don't know I so I for me this poem also contains all of those all of those ways that we um wordlessly often act out as well as discover the rituals that provide that that moment we will remember later and in Bill's reading I heard so much uh, it was so complex with regret and anger and the story of the angers of, of that house. And so um, I, thank, I thank him for that, that reading of a speaker who, who has experienced something we can only wonder about. Mm. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, I, you know, um, I think it may be time for another reading uh, which is exactly where we'd hope we'd be at 7.30. So uh, hats off to Bill Murray, hats off to our incredible panel for getting us started and modeling the way forward. Nobody's going away quite yet, um, but now we're gonna turn things over uh, to Moses Ingram, who's gonna read it in her own way. And then we'll ask the panel, those that you feel moved by what she said to respond again, uh, to jump back in and, and pick something out. And let, just the exercise is that, you know, is let, let's, Let's all listen to Moses fresh and be present with her reading uh, without preconception and take it in together. Uh, Moses, over to you. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday, Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he called, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. 
speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Thanks so much, Moses. Um, not that there's always ever uproarious applause at a poetry reading at the scale of you know a Broadway performance, but uh, you know I, I, if we were in a live setting, I know we'd hear applause on a very large scale for both you and Bill. And I'm sorry we can't replicate it on Zoom, but you have us. Um, rather than be prescriptive, well, Anthony, I see you got your hand up, so I'll go right to you. I think that's your hand. Uh, yeah. Go right ahead. Uh, only because. Moses' reading made me go right back into being a medic. As a paramedic in New York City, it's, 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 there's so many instances that we go to. And you think they're gonna, people are gonna respond in certain ways to the things that we're there to help them with. And it's so different than a hospital setting. In a hospital, you're playing by the hospital's rules. You're in their building, but I go into your house. I see the pictures on the wall, although that's a picture of me, don't mind. You know, I see the pictures on the wall. I see the family photos. I see the medals that you won or the trophy that you won for getting first place or something world's greatest dad coffee mug. I see all that. We see all that as medics. And when she read it, read it in the cadence she read, it reminded me of when I go and we try and revive somebody and it's their dad. And I go to the family afterwards and I say, there's nothing more we can do. And we, you know, we did all the medications, the CPR and everything. And they never talk about, what well, do you think it was a heart attack? They go, if I only knew it was, it was just his birthday. Or what, what, did, what did I know? I had no time. I had no time. You know, they had a whole lifetime with them. But they had no time now because time is of the essence at the moment. Now they realize that there's no more time. And I realize that because I have to bear witness to that. I'm in that time loop with them as a medic. And I sit there and I look and I go to the, to the family and I look at the patient who on the floor, you know, we're trying to clean up so that they can have one more moment, but this time the time is frozen because they have no more time to express it. And then it automatically brings you back to my life. Like Natalie, my brother was taken by gun violence. And I remember my last words to him was, yeah, Richie, I'll buy the radio. You think about what you would say to somebody if you knew it was their last moment with them. Dad, thank you for setting the heat on in the morning and polishing my shoes so I'd look presentable for the day, even though you went out with cracked hands. I mean, imagine if you were able to say that in that way, in the cadence that, that uh, Moses read it in. How impactful, Brian, you have a kid Imagine when your daughter gets to be 16 or 17, she has that moment where she goes, dad, thank you. And even if she doesn't say thank you, she goes, I polished the shoes today like you did. You know, the, 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 the reminded me of a family that I pronounced recently uh, uh, in October where the woman kept saying it was her husband and she kept saying, who's gonna do all these things that he did? Cause he was only 44 years old and he died, COVID. And all he kept, she kept saying, who's gonna do all these things? Cause all of a sudden you take stock. And this guy in this poem that Bill and, and, and Moses read is taking stock, right? So I think, I think to touch on something said prior, we may not have been able to say thank you at moments in our lives, but we're all part of this panel and we're all here trying to affect change. And I don't know if my dad and mom ever envisioned that 
but this is my way of saying thanks because I didn't say it when they were alive in such ways. So, you know, this is, we're, we're doing it. We're thanking the universe in our own way. So uh, thank you, Moses. That was very uh, poignant when you read it that way. Thanks, Anthony. I, I was really struck listening to you. I was thinking about how poetry and a poem like those Winter Sundays can bring us into the same space, same present space that death can bring us into. And that birth, you were talking about birth before we started the uh, broadcast, but that, that these liminal moments can bring us into this space where we're, we take stock, where we're conscious of all the things we wish we could say or didn't say. Um, and so I love this connection you're making between the thresholds that you stand upon as a paramedic every day over and over again, and the threshold that a poem like this places us all upon as we listen to it and bear witness to it together. Um, it's not mandatory that the panelists all respond. So I, I'm just gonna go to whoever feels moved next. But before we do that, um, I just wanna plant the first seed of the first question out in the audience that we have a few hands already up. So if you have your hand up, we won't erase you, but we hope you'll answer this question, um, which is, um, you know, the poem, uh, Robert Hayden wrote this poem in the 60s. Um, it's 2021. Uh, it's called Dark, Those, those uh, uh, those winter Sundays, we're now living through a cold, uh, one would might argue a blue black uh, winter. Um, and um, in spite of the distance, this is in, he grew up in Detroit, he was African American, he was very specific, uh, poor, there's very specific uh, background to this poet and, and what he's putting forth, but also there's so many universal connections one could make. Um, in spite of the distance of time and maybe even of culture, or maybe you, maybe it feels direct to you, what spoke to you tonight in uh, Moses' reading, or you can respond to Bill's too, uh, you can respond to both, what touched you, what was true? And we're gonna come out to the audience in just a second, but maybe some one of the other panelists wants to jump in and um, I won't legislate who it is, but um, Montessi or Natalie or Altabar, Karen, I don't know if you wanna respond. I can respond. I, I really, re the emotion in her voice really resonated with me at the beginning of the poem. And she, her voice almost cracked as she read the blue black cold and then talked about his cracked hands. And I felt that I, I felt just the thought of that miserably cold house. And, you know, this man had to be hurting as he got up and went to build the heat in the house for his family. And you know, that sacrifice that he is making, suffering in the cold, and the word blue black just really stood out to me. It just seems powerful. And you know, living in Michigan today, it was 10 degrees when I got up. And so I, I, I know that kind of cold. And so I'm thinking in a house that isn't well heated, in a house where he has to get the fire going, it, it probably gets extremely cold in the night. And yet there's the sun lying in the bed, under the covers, listening, clearly awake, but not getting up to help and waiting until he's summoned. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, Natalie, are you leaning forward to unmute yourself? Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> um, so the way Moses said it in the beginning, Sundays too, my father got up early. And it kind of connects with the work that I do because I did experience domestic violence and some partner violence in my household. and. Yes, my dad did cause harm to my mom, but at the same time, he was still my dad. So even though we weren't living in the same home after a certain while, he still did get up on Sunday to make sure he came to pick me up, even if we spent like two or three hours together. And one of the things, even with the work that we do is that we understand that even though someone may be causing harm, they can still change, right? That doesn't change their identity. He may not have been a great um, husband, but he, for me, it was, he was a great dad. And so when, um, you know, people would say negative things about him, I said, but I still want to thank him, right? Because he was still a dad towards me. And that's why a lot of times the work that we do is more saying that we, we don't want to throw people out of our communities, right? We want them to know that you can change, right? Provided the resources and the support. And that's the thing when Moses was saying this poem is, you know, Sundays too, he would wake up, right? And he would get up early. And that's one of the things that resonated with me as she said this poem again the second time. Thanks, Natalie, that's so powerful. 
um, one of the things I respect most about the Cor Center for Core Innovation and the work you guys do is the impulse to not see violence, however it ap appears, uh, outside the context of the larger intergenerational cycle that it's part of. And the only way to break that cycle is to see the humanity, even in perpetrators of violence. And that's, you know, that's, that's scary for a lot of people, especially those who've experienced been on the receiving end of violence. But I hear you saying, if I understand it, that um, seeing that possibility of being a good father, even though a person may not be a good partner or, or husband is part of, the, part of the strategy of beginning the process of helping them change rather than judging them and incarcerating them and you know, all the other things that our society does. Uh, thank you so much. Bill, uh, you have to unmute yourself, Bill. You're muted currently, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a little bit of feedback, there you are. Well, there, there, I just wanna speak about what I really liked about Moses' reading was um, the way that she, um, she sort of, accelerated through the hard parts that it was almost like she was on thin ice. Her emotion was so present in her voice that to say the words like angers and, and cold and, and labor and ache, that it took speed to get over them without sinking down through the thin ice. And, and yet there was a delightful, beautiful payoff the way she sort of flew when she spoke of polishing my good shoes, like he finally understood how important those good shoes were to me. It was a beautiful thing, beautiful to hear. Thank you, Bill. Can I follow up? Um, sure, of course. Yeah. One, uh, yes, and I, I heard this not quite mature speaker rushing through the hard parts, but also, um, um, cherishing and still feeling the glow. <laughs> there, one heard in Moses reading the someone who'd really felt taken care of. I mean, the way you also read banked fires, banked fires blaze, right? We, it, the, the house might have been cold, but now it was blazing and someone had made sure you had good shoes. <laughs> you just, and you knew who. Couldn't agree more. Um, you know what, uh, panelists, if, I'm gonna start going to the audience at this point, because we'd love to start weaving some folks in. The longer we wait, the harder it is to stoke that fire and we wanna light it and keep it lit for the duration of our time. So we're gonna bring them in, but all you have to do is raise your hand or say, hey, Brian, and we'll j pull you right back in. I'm not, I don't wanna, uh, take anything away, but Maria, Teresa, Miles, you're the first person who raised their hand. We'll go over to you. What resonated with you? What touched you about these readings? What was true? Hi, guys. Um, I want to say thank you. Um, I'm over in the UK at the moment, so with the time slot changing, it's about midnight over here, but I really wanted to take part in these, this one. Um, thank you, Bill, and to Moses for the reading. What I heard was the generational difference between how Bill portrayed um, his version of it to Moses. And I think that comes with it, the experience of age, you know? In the times when I grew up, I grew up in a large family um, of 18 aunts and uncles, and his grandfather that was my patriarchal figure um, as my father was always on the roads with the trucks. Um, so grandpa was the one who set the values and the values were that on Sunday, you wore your good clothes, you wore your polished shoes to church. You, um, you made sure that the chores that were done to have that family time were done so it was comfortable. It wasn't just a case of that he would go out to work or dad would go out to work and bring, you know, provide for the family. That provided didn't stop because it wasn't a weekday. That providing and that responsibility was very much ingrained with the responsibility of parenthood. 
and where I hear, you know, the cold cracked hands, he's not doing that because he wants to go and work out in that blue black cold. He's doing that because it's his responsibility to love his family. And, you know, you bring these children into the world to care for them no matter what. So I, I hear a lot of different messages in this, but I also hear that there is regret from the, if you like, the, nar the narrative version of the, the child for not getting up to help, for staying comfy under those bedclothes until it, the air was warm to escape those bedclothes without suffering. And that it was the father's responsibility to alleviate that suffering for the family. Um, and I've, I've also written down that as the poem was written in the 60s, some of the comforts of home that we are pleasured with today of central heating or, you know, gas fires, the, the need and the task to go and light a fire um, is not a minimal task. It's effort. You've got to clear the ashes out the grate. You've got to, you know, chop the kindling. You've got to build a fire in a certain way. So it does have air to it to blaze. So all of those tasks are done with um, care and the need to protect. It's not just like what we experience today of flipping a switch. If we were to put these tasks to our young people today, what would they do? You know, would they know how to light a fire? Would they know how to, what hard work is? You know, would they know that working on the docks or working in, you know, cold weather without the comforts of duck down coats or multiple layers of clothing? Mm. I don't think they, they have a full appreciation for just how time has changed in the 50, 60 years since the, the poem was written and and how it reflects on the times that are changing if we were to ask our young people now what is a hardship to them we might get you know oh my internet is not as fast as it could be I can't do what I want to do that gives me pleasure mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of comparisons I'd really it's a shame that the poets died because I'd love to know what his version of it would be nowadays so thank um, you so no. much thank, thank you, you so much maria really patrice i really appreciate that um i love that you centered your remarks on you know this generational difference um and even i even think about the uk and the united states and so many of the differences and standards of living i know how you know it, some of these um uh technologies aren't actually that far back you know, in terms of uh, when when we switched over in the UK to, to central heat, as you mentioned, uh, for a lot of homes, some of them so old. But this idea that I, I actually want to say, I'm not in any way contradicting what you just said, but I imagine just because I also have a child and I'm watching her through the pandemic, and also because I know that there are a lot of children right now who are um, starving uh, in first world countries, let alone uh, uh, second and third world because of this pandemic. Um, it's, it strikes me that um, this generation of children actually will know uh, hardship on a scale that maybe those who lived through World War II or other major world catastrophes and, and uh, wars knew. Um, and how will that inform their understanding of their relationship with their parents with whom they lived through this experience? And now we're back to where Lisa started, which is, you know, we're in our homes with our families falling back into patterns. The other thing I was thinking about when I was listening is um, to several of the people who talked is, it, I guess it's possible to be, even as a young person, because I'm hearing some young people speak and thinking, it's possible to be conscious of all these things your father's doing for you and still remain under the covers <laughs> and still appear indifferent. Um, well, when you're in front of your parent who's doing all these things, to, to both know that you owe them gratitude and not out of ingratitude, but just out of being a child, um, and what I took from Moses's reading, uh, just riffing off what Bill said, is all the ways that children have to protect themselves 
Um, and uh, one of the ways is focusing on, you know, in her reading, the shoes that were polished as a foothold to something positive in a cold and potentially chronically angry household. Um, so I was, I was really touched by all that. We have some other people, we got a bunch of hands, but um, Sylvia, you're next and Diana will come after Sylvia, please. Goody. Well, I just want to thank everybody. I love this poem so much. I teach it all the time. And I'm thrilled to hear these two amazing readings and also the personal responses. I very much wanted to be here so I could bring all of this back to my students. I wanted to talk as a teacher uh, just for a moment. The, the thing that I want to add to this conversation, I hope it will be useful, is to just for a minute think about this poem as a poem. Um, anytime I tell my students, anytime you see a 14 line poem, think a sonnet. And it's not so for me, it's not just that the poem is 50, 60 years old, but that the sonnet form is 450 years old, at least in English. And what's amazing about what Hayden does in this poem is he uses this ancient form and he makes it colloquial, he makes it direct, and he brings it to us today. He brings it to Detroit, and he brings it to American vernacular. This is not what my students at least think of as a stuffy court poetry. Um, but he makes it real, but he's, he's still speaking back to this tradition of love poems. Uh, sonnets are usually thought of as, you know, you got this male lover singing the praises of the female beloved. This doesn't do that, but it is still, I think, a love poem. So in a very different way. So I thought the readings, uh, not for a minute to take away from anybody's very heartfelt and, and sincere and, and touching narratives, but the two readings made it colloquial, made it contemporary. And I love that Hayden does that. So thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Yeah, I really appreciate that about the readings too. That, And that's what theater is. And that's what we're doing also in this space together. It's about being present in the moment um, and being present with the words and being present with our thoughts. And to do that with a, an ancient form or a medieval form, and then to make reinvent it and to make it present for the present moment. Well, that's, that's sort of what Theater of War Productions and I know Poetry in America that's what we're trying to do all the time. Uh, but it's what the actor or the sensitive reader like uh, Moses or Bill are able to do uh, in, in really miraculous ways when they inhabit those forms. Um, Diana, we'll go to you next. And then after Diana, um, I think we're gonna, uh, we'll continue to take hands from the audience. I see Al Tabar, maybe we'll go to Al Tabar. And then um, well, maybe we'll hear uh, President Biden's reading, which Lisa will set up as a sort of third uh, iteration. And then we'll take some more uh, responses from the audience and, and then we'll bring it on home. We promise we're going to keep this program maximum to 90 minutes. It's a school night, uh, but um, but we uh, we want to ring from this experience as much as we can. We've already pulled out so many themes. It's been really beautiful. Um, but Diana, it's great to see you again. Over to you. Great. I'll keep it brief. Um, but I just wanted to add this alternate perspective of rather than regret, this idea that um, giving and receiving is both unconditional. And that's the office of those people at that time. Um, and I think that I, I like that idea that you don't necessarily have to feel bad for being the kid lying in bed while your dad does all this work, because that's your office at that moment. That's what you're supposed to do, you know, because if you didn't do that, then the parent couldn't do the unconditional thing of keeping you warm and doing that caretaking for you. You know, there has to be a, a receiver every time that there's a giver. And so I guess I kind of I kind of like that idea. And also the idea that the dad wasn't necessarily suffering through that. You know, his daily work gave him cracked hands. You know, it was what happened outside of the house that was really hard. And I say that from the perspective of somebody sitting here by the banked fire. I live in rural Vermont. It's really cold and snowy here right now. And my husband is running up and down the stairs between our upstairs wood stove and our downstairs wood boiler so that we have warm air and hot water. And I know I can take a shower tonight. And I know that it started with him cutting down a tree and taking care of me. And that's pretty sweet. And it's unconditional and I have to receive it and he has to give it. And it's just what people do. 
um, for other people in a cold house. And then I just had this other little thought about the polished shoes that that was that that dad cared about how things appeared to the outside world. Um, you know, I'm going to do these things for you that make you feel more comfortable, and I'm also going to do this little little thing that's going to show the world that you know we're we take care of ourselves. I, I thought that was so beautiful, Diana, and you, and I think it was Maria, Teresa, both pointed to developmental, to the sort of the whole life cycle and developmental differences. Sometimes when I read the poem, I hear the kind of surly adolescent, <laughs> and I think that's what we're, it, it makes a difference if the speaker is 16 and if the speaker is eight. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but it's, it's very hard to tell what's ingratitude and what is knowing what children shouldn't have to take on. And I think all of those ambiguities in the family, you're, you're pointing to the way with your unconditional, the way they do get negotiated moment, moment by moment. Thank you so much, Lisa and Diana. It's so great to have you back. Um, uh, I, I think I had, I'd be derelict if I didn't mention that Diana is also a, a poet and uh, like Anthony, an EMS professional. And um, that we built this sort of chorus over the last 30 performances <laughs> of, uh, of people who are on the front lines of this pandemic who also uh, I think embody what poetry is really about. And so I'm really glad you're both with us and I'm so grateful. And also I was thinking when you were speaking before we go to Alta Bar that um, you're so right. You know, it's um, uh, maybe love's offices are never truly lonely. Mm -hmm. um, it's just very hard to contemplate what it feels like to be, you know, to know how gratifying it is to be a parent and to be able to provide for a child in a cold house and to know that you're expressing your love even if you don't have the words or the capacity to do it otherwise. Um, isn't necessarily a lonely office. And there's, if there's someone there to receive that love and that's their job, that's not a lonely office either. Um, but it's very hard to think outside of our own subjective experiences of that cold house. And even looking back on it through our memories um, to, to understand what it must be like or have been like for another person in that house. And so I love you just bringing us into your cold house in Vermont and acknowledging this is what we do in a cold house. And there has to be someone to light the fire and keep it lit. And there has to be someone to receive the warmth of that fire. And, um, and that is, those are our offices um, and they aren't necessarily lonely. Um, and there, there's a sacredness, a, a sanctifying quality that I think our language in this discussion is beginning to, to recognize this father on Sunday kneeling uh, to polish this child's shoes reminds us as Diana has pointed out of our great good fortune to be on this earth able to love one another even if we're doing two shifts which I think this poem is about <laughs> as well. You work outside and then you come home and that and that's stressful. Yeah. Um, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Altabar, you've been waiting for a bit. Up to you, sir. Um, so one, as everybody was speaking and speaking their piece, and I, I heard the, spe the, the piece about it being easier for young, young folks than it was for like folks back then, right? I'm also hearing the piece about like what we do for the people in our house, right? And and Moses is reading one thing that came through to me as I'm listening to everybody speak is that, and you said at the beginning, right? But like, this is a poem written by a black author during about his experience growing up at the Great Depression with his father, right? And it is this very micro example of like what a parent does for a child. However, like if we take on the macro of it, right? It's like this father had to leave the house to go into the Great Depression and he was experiencing racism while living through the Great Depression, right? And all the ways that that he had to navigate that, right? And all the ways that that whole generation, again, to your point about like talking about like we we live in this pandemic, so we're navigating a very specific time, right? But all the ways that that generation 
specifically that generation of black people was navigating the depression and the way racism looked, right? And the way that the way that they had to navigate racism through the depression all the way up to now, right? All the way from the time of of the author's childhood, even to the time of the author's adulthood, was them making strides for their children to have an easier way in the world, right? Because they're fighting racism every day. I, their, his, his dad, in, in some form of fashion, was fighting racism. And I think to like myself, and it's like, again, to the point I made earlier, right? Like this world with, and you know the, the, the time we just saw. So this may be a little, uh, <laughs> a little different than, you know what I mean, other times, but speaking of the way that I don't have to experience racism the way my great, great grandfather experienced racism, right? And the fact that that is because somebody in that generation said, I'm going to face the world the way it is. And this is what I have to do for the generation that comes after me. Thank you so much, Al Tabar. I'm so touched by what you said. And I'm it connects to so many things that were said earlier from various perspectives, but I think about it as a parent too. I mean, the the whole point of being a parent is to create a better life for your children and their children and to create an existence where they don't have to experience the hardships you experienced. Um, so, you know, why else would we have gone through? And, you know, I, I, you know, obviously there's so much to say about racism and, you know, it doesn't seem like the arc of justice is, is linear in some ways right now. And there, there are ways that it's become more insidious and nefarious and systemic. And, um, you know, it was always systemic post re reconstruction, but that were that that should be recognized too. There are other ways that peer, people experience racism and they're shield, trying to shield their children and their children's children from those experiences as well. And um, I, the, the, those are those really beautiful things. I, I um, Maria, Teresa, I'm going to go to you, but before, just hold on to your thought, because we're exactly where we wanted to be in our run of show, which we normally don't have, but our run of show to, to set up hearing President Biden do his reading. Uh, he couldn't be with us here tonight. He's got a few things going on, <laughs> but, but luckily, uh, to, uh, Lisa had him on her show, and um, so I asked Lisa to set up this reading I know we also have about 35 other hands out there. Uh, so we'll come back and we'll get Maria Teresa's quick comments and then we'll start bringing some other folks who have been waiting patiently out in the audience. But let's hear uh, President Biden's yeah, rendition. Just, yeah, I wanna leave room for all those comments. So I'll just say a word or two. So obviously it was an immense honor uh, for me and an adventure uh, to film uh, in 2015 with Vice President Biden in his office at the old executive office building. Uh, for the uh, TV episode, I gathered a number of other interpreters, among them the great poet Elizabeth Alexander, who was President Obama's inaugural poet. And this episode includes a chorus of other readers reflecting on their families and their struggles and saying many of the things that we've been <laughs> hearing tonight, um, although I've, I've heard new things tonight as well. I wanted um, Vice President Biden to read this, this poem in particular, and this is the one I asked him to read, um, because of his sensitivity to fathers and to families, and especially to the struggles of working people. And um, to uh, go back to a comment, um, uh, I, mean, I, I can't remember, oh, Diane, no, it wasn't Diana. Someone made um, about knowing how to set a fire. I knew that um, President Biden really did understand this poem and those times when he described in detail the kind of boiler the father lights and how you bank a fire and he wiped tears from his eyes several times uh, during the interview, uh, and here is the reading. Those winter Sundays. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black coal, and then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made, banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. 
I'd wake and hear the coal splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? That was one of those tech glitches since his mouth did not mat match his face. It, there was an imperfection, but we roll with it. I assure you on Poetry in America on PBS, it all it all links up. So you can go watch uh, um, uh, the polished version uh, by going to Poetry in America's website and, and finding it. Um, but what a thrill to have, uh, at least for us, for the first time, Joe Biden, even in a recording with us and with these other fine readers, um, responding in his own way. So we're going to leave that open to interpretation and have people respond to it. But um, before we open up more, now we have uh, close to 50 hands. Out in the audience. We won't get to everybody, unfortunately, but there are more theater of war productions events to come and more Poetry in America episodes to watch. Um, but Maria Teresa, if you don't mind uh, giving us your quick response that you were holding on to, and then we're going to go out to the uh, new people in the audience. Sure. So on, on hearing that one too, what I hear the most is that I'm now reflecting inwardly for how I am as a parent and what my parents have done with me and actually taking the opportunity to unreservedly say thank you and to show that love and pay that back in kind to my parents, to my neighbours, to my children, etc. I think, you know, the poem speaks many words, but reflection and remorse just scream out at me at the moment. The greatest unsaid word between a parent and their children is thank you. You know, thank you for polishing my shoes. You didn't hear the child say that, but in the remorseful way that it's written, you hear that they wish they had. So, yeah, I think from 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 you know today onwards to take the opportunity to say thank you when we've received something from someone who's chosen to give time love affection to us so see that as in my soldierly days as well so thank you maria Teresa. really appreciate it. anthony you want to respond to that as we're bringing some folks on go ahead i'll be real brief um my father was two years older than joe biden I don't know if they came from a generation that would know how to accept the thank you. Because when somebody says thank you to me, I want to give them a hug and show love, you know, bring them in, high five them, you know, do something, let's go out for a drink. I think if I said thank you to my dad at certain times in his life, he would look at me funny and be like, what do you want? You know, or he would sit there and say, thanks for what? And he might even tell me to shut up in a playful way, but I don't know if he came from a generation because I know his parents and his parents definitely did not expect a thank you. They didn't even say anything like that. There was no communication. So it's, it's very poignant to me to, to hear this thanks because I know what I would have liked to say. My dad wasn't very affectionate. I had a I remember as an adult, I would go up to him and shake his hand and he, he, give me the alligator arm. <laughs> but then what I would notice is I had to condition him. The kid is conditioning him to put it. And then when I would see him, his hand would come out even further now. And then I would bring him in for the bro hug. And then, then it became a real hug. So I, I, we're all interpreting it as a, a remorseful thank you for the deeds that were done. I don't know if his dad in the poem would know how to accept that thank you. Not that he wouldn't want it, but I don't know if he would know how to accept it in the way we think he would accept it. He'd probably just polish the shoes on Monday now as well. You know, he'd do a Sunday, Monday polish. That would be his reciprocation. So I just wanted to bring that up as, as somebody with Joe Biden hearing in the background. Yeah, Joe Biden's almost old enough to be, you know, that, that older generation, we call the greatest generation, um, you know, and we've had some members of that generation, we do a lot of work on military veterans and their experiences of war. And I've had some members of that generation stand up and say in the discussions back in the early days, 
of our performing, I don't understand why we're talking about any of this. Right. And um, not that there wasn't understanding between them or consciousness of it all, but I think I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, no parent does what they do to be thanked. Uh, but parents can definitely feel underappreciated. And, um, and, uh, and this is an important thing to bring up. Also, I was thinking when Maria was talking, you know, my daughter the other day, I have a, we have an actor who was part of our company who died, Reggie Cathy, a couple years ago. And yet we were very close and he was one of our greatest actors. And my daughter asked me if there was a technology at the time where we could talk to him because she saw us talking through FaceTime and Zoom and and I'm listening to all these people sort of talking about their parents and sort of offering thanks to them tonight. And I'm thinking we're just, not that we'll ever create that technology, but we've created one where we can talk to each other all over the world at the same time and bear witness to each other thanking our parents. And it feels like a sacred act and it feels like a prayer and it feels like an act of remembrance just to be in the space with each other. Um, even and if our parents- you, Brian, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Please. But poetry is a technology. Yeah. <laughs> it is that it's a technology we bestow on the future and that the past bestows on us. I mean, Robert Hayden is teaching us now and we are, we are touching him. Yeah, absolutely. And learning from him. And this is an ancient technology. Of course, we, we've been learning from ancient Greeks but other, other cultures as well, uh, ancient Africa, ancient Japan. Uh, in how story and poetry is a technology for doing the very thing that my daughter asked if we built a technology to do. No, we have it. We, it's already here. It's just that we bring it together with Zoom. People talk about Zoom fatigue. And I just want to say I'm never fatigued by Zoom when we're doing something uh, sacred and spiritual together in a way that could never have happened if there weren't a pandemic and we weren't stuck in our homes and we weren't looking for ways to connect because we desperately need to. And um, so it's it's an immense gift to be able to do this with you. Mariella, you've been waiting for some time and you are next. Um, just thrilled to be here. I love Diana's comment because I think, you know, it took out some of the, the poem is serious, but some of the seriousness out of it and, and made it uh, more approachable and made you feel like, you know, there is that, you know, reciprocation that we we have from people, you know, that sometimes someone does, like my husband, for example, He's the one that does all the lunches. And sometimes, you know, he fixes all the lunches for us. And at work, sometimes I'll be like, what did Victor give me today? Am I going to like this? And I'm not grateful. And everyone I work with looks at me and like, maybe you should be happy. You have a husband who does this for you. But, and as a teacher, I love the poem too, because I think uh, one of the panelists mentioned how, um, you know, it's a sonic and uh, I'm reading Romeo and Juliet right now with my students and, you know, the parents always come up and, you know, I, I think of, you know, if Juliet had to write a poem to, to her father, thanking her for what he was trying to do, you know, uh, fix her up with Paris and trying to do all the right things so that she could live past 13 and whatever. So, um, and from both readings, one of the things that jumped out at me was the, the words or the phrase austere offices, because as a parent now, I have 12 year old twins and they're entering that teenagehood that uh, we all dread. Um, and I feel sometimes like it's, it's an austere office and a, it's a lonely office. You know, I thank God that I have my, my husband with me, but at the same time, there's times that, you know, you're worried about all of these things and you're trying to navigate in your mind of all the things that you can fix as a parent, but that at the same time you have no control over. Um, and you worry about it. It does feel quite lonely, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Mario. I really appreciate that. Um, before we go down to Maria, um, honestly, <laughs> I know you had something to say and we'll, we'll come up to you. Yeah, so I think like um, a lot of the conversation has been about, I think like how the speaker of the poem, like in his later years reflected on um, what his father had done for him and had only then begun starting to feel gratitude. But I kind of wanted to, like give my perspective that I feel like I have like known about all the work that my parents do for me and all the responsibilities they have and I'm grateful for it but sometimes it's just it's almost like it's hard to accept that kind of love it feels like when you realize how much that like someone could care about you that much that they would go to so that like such great extents to 
protect you and nurture you. It's almost like scary to acknowledge that kind of love. And depending on like the kind of relationship you've already established with your family, sometimes it's not even that easy to say thank you, even though you do feel super grateful because you, it's, it's just like, how do I even acknowledge like, like what words could I say to acknowledge everything that these people have done for me and everything like my parents and my family have done for me. And like, it's almost overwhelming. Like I can't even believe like someone could love me that much. It's like a little scary <laughs> to think about almost. So, yeah. That was so beautiful, Monesty. And it, but it, it also for me brought out the wordlessness. This is a poem. <laughs> Poems are written in words, but it's it's in some ways a poem about wordlessness um, and how love can be exchanged um, in some through acts that are not spoken, through rituals, acts and rituals that are not spoken. I also love um, this idea that acknowledging or putting or even attempting to put words to that love or that gratitude could be so overwhelming for a child that even though they're aware of it and maybe have insight into it through their sensitivity as a young person that older people no longer have um it, it it's uh, if you let it all in uh it, it could be uh overwhelming in a way that um is very frightening as you say scary mm -hmm. and i, I I think that's such a beautiful thing to bring. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go down to Maria because I'm, and I see your hand, Anthony, but we have, we're going to keep going down and I'll, we'll swing back um, just because uh, we have 12 minutes left in our incredible time and, and 50 people out there who want to say something. But um, uh, Maria, over to you. I'll make it real quick. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. I recently discovered Theater of War and loved this project as much for the amazing performers you bring on as the panelists. And uh, Natalie and Al Tabar, just the the work that you're involved with and its relevance to this, <coughs> this poem and the, the chronic anger. I uh, don't think there's a more profound and and um, just an incredible work. So so and and I speak about this because I'm one generation removed from an attempted murder suicide of domestic violence in my family, and I know. It, it resonates for generations to come. So I, I want to say I loved hearing all of the comments and and certainly experienced a lot of um, the, the similar generational, uh, the personal pieces. The piece I want to say that really uh, lit up for me the moment that Bill said the line, no one ever thanked him, is it became very political for me. And thinking of the teachers and the frontline care workers and all of the people whose work is so uh, essential to our most basic sense of security and comfort, um, that just really, really, you know, resonated. So thank you for the chance to share that. Thank you, Maria. And I'm so pleased to hear you say that, you know, part of our work over the last nine months has been trying to move past facile, easy expressions of gratitude to EMS workers or teachers, which, you know, the impulse to applaud is great, but to be in a room together with several frontline uh, people and to bear witness to their truths and to acknowledge the complexity of what they've been through and are articulating um, is an act of gratitude as well. Um, and um, so I, I appreciate that, but acknowledging that you can read this poem metaphorically about those who provide security that for us that we um, we show indifference to and we don't know how to thank and, um, and and that can be a very lonely office as Anthony and Diana have expressed in previous performances. I know I'm sure Al Tabar and um, Natalie can can attest and and, and many others. Um, Marie. Marie uh, Maria, Marie, uh, you are next, please. Uh, Mireya. Maria, great. <laughs> Mireya. 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 Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, what I see here is what poetry does so beautifully, um, because um, how do you express the ineffable? How do you express, you know, a sentiment and. Um, and here it, you take the everyday, you know, the mundane, um, and we can all relate to that. 
And uh, the other element here is the senses, you know, because we see the polished shoes, we see the light, we see, we feel the heat, you know, we feel the, the cold um, and uh, we feel the, um, the hands and, and all of that. And all those elements are uh, elements that come into ritual and um, um, in, in a ritual you need to appeal to or the, the visible, you know, the smell, you know, here we have the fire like that and um, the tactile and, um, you know, so all, this, all the senses. So, you know, the, this poet is using all, all the <laughs> craft, you know, that is available, you know, to put forth something that we can all connect with, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I love that. Uh, connecting back to what Lisa said earlier and what we were trying to say, you know, that um, by virtue of bringing us into that Sunday morning in that household and its rituals, uh, we are performing a ritual that brings us into each other's households. Uh, and and um, that is the power of this technology of, of, of the ritual itself. Um, thank you so much. Anjali. Uh, you've been waiting for a while and you are next. Anjali? <laughs> there you are. Hi, am I unmuted? You are. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to uh, respond to um, what everyone is saying is really resonating with me and but also thinking a lot about the political what Alta Brauer said and also what Maria said. Um, I'm a medical student and during the first three months of the pandemic we ended up volunteering, a couple of us volunteering to take phone calls from families um, of hospitalized patients. And a lot of people calling in um, with these kind, children calling in about their parents, trying to get an update, um, but we didn't have a lot of information. And so a lot of sharing of these kinds of um, memories and regrets and memories of these little acts. I remember one woman talking about um, her dad who was, 80, but she was in shock that he was in the hospital because he had changed her car tire the week before. Um, and he was the one who had helped her start her shoe collection. Um, and I think the other bit of it that, I mean, a lot of I, I, the hospital we work at it is the patients are more than 80% black and a lot of anger and frustration around that. And I think also the other thing that comes out to me is, um, it, again, is this, this, and no one thanked us, um, the enormous pressure that working class families are under when parents or the working adults have to go out in the world and what a privilege it is for the families who can, who don't have to do that, right? Who, who right now in this time of stress can be home with their kids and protect them and the families for whom essential workers people who are working in the hospitals, people who are working in grocery stores, people who are working in pharmacies who have to go out and that thank you um, feels insufficient because people are not being protected and supported um, in the ways that they should be. And that's racism and that's classism. Um, and just the last bit of that is a lot of hor really, really horrifying stories of children who were essential workers and had to go out and they brought COVID back into their homes where their parents were living because they live in intergenerational houses. And again, this like this regret, this person raised me. And because of the pressure of society, I am the one who caused them to be in this hospital dying. Um, so yeah, I, I think that this, one of the things that really stands out to me is that there's anger and regret that has to do with the interpersonal relationship, but there's also anger at society for creating this situation in the first place, for creating a pressure on the family um, that creates this, this situation of, of, of a lack of communication, an anger, an undertone, a dad having to leave early in the morning, not having time to spend and, and build that relationship. Um, so that, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. I think that was, a beautiful um, follow-up to Altabar's um, pointing us to what he called the macro 
uh, and you know, the one word for it is political and another is sort of their structural reasons that this is a cold house. Um, it's the depression, it's that they're black. A number of the readers um, whom I, I filmed for TV read into chronic angers of that house and anger in the house itself, a, an unhealthiness, read health inequities, <laughs> the, the chronic diseases of poverty um, that may also bear on, um, bear on this family and, um, and just overwork. You know, I, I think as I've, I keep coming back to the stresses, these are, you know, this is a guy, Sundays too, yes, he's creating a ritual for the family, um, but it's just never over. You know, the, the shifts, it's shift after shift after shift and somehow to preserve the emotional fortitude to bring a different kind of tenderness and care to the work at home while what you have to do is slug it out in the world. The stress of those two roles too. I, I heard in, in Anjali in your, in your stories or maybe just in the world we live in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, what I also appreciate so much Anjali is the, the bringing into the sonnet, the present tense reality of the pandemic. There's no way to hear it. There's no way to experience it. It's from the 60s. It's referencing an earlier period. Uh, but we're living through this now, which has accelerated all of these inequalities to a place where they can be seen and they're tangible and hopefully ways they will never be able to be unseen. And there are people suffering on inordinate scales that from pandemics that preceded this pandemic of, of poverty and inequality and systemic oppression and incarceration, all these things. And, and, and now there's COVID. And so I, you know, we're toward the end of our discussion, but thinking about what those winter Sundays during our winter of COVID must be like in Detroit or in, uh, in the Bronx or in for uh, black and brown families who were already experiencing uh, many of the pressures that we're discussing uh, now with COVID on top of it. Um, uh, so Evelyn, we have time for you to say something and then, and then Anthony, I'm gonna bring it back to you because I skipped over you and you're gonna have the last word, uh, no pressure to sum everything up into one brief and perfect statement, but I know you will. Evelyn, uh, we'll come to you. I Thank you. I really didn't expect to uh, be, you know, zapped into this. And uh, so I was actually uh, trying to write my dad to tell him, to show him the poem and to write him an email. And I just wanted to echo Anthony um, because my dad is living and I've had a tumultuous uh, probably childhood and then relationship with my father but I know he loves me and I'm 41, so I'm good and we're good. Uh, but it's hard to hear that poem for me in a way because um, he's of a generation. He was born in Taiwan. He immigrated to Canada. He immigrated to the US, he assimilated and he doesn't hear necessarily. And I don't know how many different ways I can poke him to try to get him to play with me, <laughs> but he isn't the type maybe to accept the thank you or, but he does accept that I love you. And, and he, and I just wanted to say that. And you guys have been way more profound than this moment. <laughs> I, I find this poem also reaches out to me because right now my mentor is, Dying, so <laughs> very great. Oh, bless you! You're very brave. I want to say thank you to and look back, and mine looks just like you, but Chinese. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, thank. Thank no, you. no one could be more eloquent than you. Uh, in being present in the way you've been. What a gift. Um, thank you so much. Anthony, uh, no, no pressure. Uh, we only have a couple minutes, but um, I skipped over you and 
you're our best customer, so I'm coming back to you uh, for, for a last word. So, Evelyn, he, he may not know how to reciprocate or express the thank you, but he hears it. He hears it. And having somebody who sat bedside with his dad while he was dying, you one of the few things that popped up was the gratitude. So trust me, they hear it. And that'll lead that that I was I, I want to say her name right, Manasi. 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 She said something about being young and being having all this pressure to, you know, you see all this stuff, especially nowadays with all the technology. We can see that we have something so much better than others. Whereas maybe in years past when we were just surrounded by our local town and everybody was poor or everybody had this, you know, we could see that we have more than others and we feel this pressure like I don't deserve or I don't have gratitude. And it's hard to take stock of what we see and do in real time. But one of the things I wanted to leave everybody here with is especially when you're growing up and for some of us growing up, can, it's gonna be our whole lives. But if, as long as we have parents around as you're trying to figure it out in your teenage and 20 and 30s, remember your parents are getting older too. We take so much stock of ourselves getting older. We forget to realize that our parents are aging with us. And if we can sit there and take, and just have that brief moment of consciousness to go, I just turned 21, that makes my mom 45. Mom, you're 45. Happy birthday. How are you? I love you. You know, you remember to take stock of the, of, you know, even if you have to do it in a reminder on a calendar with these electronic devices that we see so much with nowadays, and especially each other, and you sit there and go, oh, mom's birthday. That's when I'm going to take stock of things and go, thank you, mom or dad, you know, for polishing my shoes or for getting the heat on or for making my sandwiches or for immigrating from Taiwan and giving me a life. I'm trying to remember everybody else here. Or for me being, you know, mom and dad, thank you for giving me the opportunity, even if it, some of it was painful, that I'm able to express myself in front of all these wonderful people and Bill Murray and Moses Ingram and Brian for all these people. I mean, it's a real treat to be able to say this. If we take stock of ourselves, because we always are internalizing, let's externalize a little and remember that everybody else is getting older with us. Thank you, everyone. Beautiful last word. Thank you, uh, Anthony. As uh, Anthony and others who've been with us and Lisa know, um, we didn't come here to tie a bow on those winter Sundays. Uh, we didn't come here to say definitively anything. Uh, we just came to utilize this technology of Robert Hayden's beautiful 1960s sonnet to have this exchange. And uh, it's been overwhelming for me. You know, we've never done anything this short, as I mentioned before. I, I imagine we could go on for many more hours. Uh, we won't. Uh, we'll invite you to our next performance. We'll invite you to poetryinamerica.org uh, to watch this episode if you haven't already. Uh, and hear others responding to it tonight. Um, but as a benediction, um, at the end of every performance, uh, we say uh, on our 31st electronic Zoom performance, if you related to anything that's been said here in the last hour and a half in relation to this poem, those winter Sundays, you're not alone in this virtual room. You're not alone across the country of the United States and the world. Uh, a lot of our recent performances had as more than 70 countries represented and we know we have folks tuning in. Most critically, you're not alone across culture and time. And that was borne out in so many of the very specific responses that people gave to this poem tonight from their perspectives and their cultures and their backgrounds. Um, after an early performance of one of our projects, uh, someone stood up and answered a question we often ask, which is why did the, why did the poet write the text and she stood up and said, I think you wrote it to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, um, which apparently is something that a newspaper man said at the beginning of the 20th century. It's been attributed to lots of other people. I really personally don't care. It's our, it's our motto. We hope that we've uh, brought comfort 
to the afflicted tonight and uh, that we're comforted that we can come together during this very dark, this black, blue, blue, black winter and uh, that we can uh, connect across uh, space uh, in this incredible way while in isolation. Comfort that we can all have an interpretation and it can be valid of this poem. And afflicted that there's so much work to be done to address uh, the suffering and the unsaid things between us all, uh, people to our left and our right every day and afflicted that talking about a poem isn't gonna change all of that, it's just the beginning. Um, and it's with that sense of affliction that we leave you with the hope that leads to more uh, conversations, maybe not with people you don't know, but with people you do know, which sometimes are harder. Uh, and um, if we were in a live setting, there's no question that when I thank uh, our incredible actors, Bill Murray and Moses Ingram and our wonderful panel, uh, Anthony, Monacy, Altabar, uh, Natalie, um, and Karen. Uh, and we thank Lisa, and we thank Marjolaine Goldsmith, our company manager and digital producer has been behind the scenes making this all happen. And we thank Poetry in America. Um, there would be uproarious applause, so deafening we'd have to cover our ears, but unfortunately all you have is us on the screen. Um, but with that, I wanna say thank you to all of you for joining us tonight and being part of this uh, exchange. Um, if you liked this experience, uh, the next Theater of War performance will be our gun violence project, Hercules in Pennsylvania. Uh, you don't have to be in Pennsylvania, but on Zoom on uh, February 18th, and that's up already. You can sign up. We'll be announcing the cast very soon. It'll be many others to come. You've already joined our mailing list by showing up tonight, so you'll be hearing from us. And of course, I've already given you Poetry in America's uh, website. That's Poetry in America. Org. Uh, you can follow Theater of War Productions at Theater of War, the American way, E-R, Theater of War, um, to learn more, to watch videos, to find out what we're up to. And we hope you will follow us and leave some comments about tonight's experience so people can read them and continue the conversation. With that, I just want to thank Lisa one more time for this incredible experience. Thank you so much, Brian. It's been an honor and a joy to do this program with you and with all of you, uh, Bill, and Moses, I'm moved beyond words. And uh, uh, the readings you gave. And special thanks to our president, uh, Joe Biden, for his reading tonight as well. Yes. Thank, thanks, thank you all. Thank, thank you all. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. We'll see you at the next one. We hope. Until then, uh, I hope you stay safe and well. Stay well. And we'll talk Good again. Night. Soon. Good night. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Moses. Thanks, Moses.